All right, everybody, I have two o'clock. And hello, my name is Abby Bristol with the Van Buren Conservation District, and I would like to welcome you to our third Backyard Symposium. This week-long series is designed to help landowners bring their yards to life as a beautiful, sustainable part of our environment. From backyards and lots in urban areas to rural homesteads, green space is beneficial for our mental health and physical health and for the animals and plants that we share, we share our space with. Through this series, we're hoping you can learn uh, actionable, approachable ways to make your space a bit greener. In the chat, I invite you to introduce yourself and share what you would like to learn today and feel free to interact there throughout the presentation. By default, all attendees are muted and your, your cameras are off. And this allows us to record these presentations so they can be uploaded to our YouTube channel for those that couldn't join us today. You can message us using the contact form on our website vanburencd.org forward slash contact dash two, or you can sign up for our newsletter using the subscribe option at the bottom of our website. This webinar is being recorded and recorded webinars are going to be posted next week at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash vanburencd forward slash videos. You can follow us on Facebook at Van Buren CD. If you have any questions um, throughout this presentation, go to the Q&A icon at the top or bottom of your screen, and you can submit a question to the presenter there. Type your question in the box that comes up and click the send button. Questions will be asked um, by me, the moderator, at the end of the presentation and also throughout a little bit um, between the sections of Lucas's presentation. And if you ever need help uh, with using Zoom, go ahead and use the chat feature. Click the chat icon to reach out to me, the moderator, for help. So I would like to introduce Lucas. Uh, Lucas Hartman is currently serving his fourth year as a conservation technician for the Van Buren Conservation District, specializing in helping farmers and landowners apply for cost share through the U.S. Farm Bill. Today, Lucas's presentation is entitled Soils 101, Composition and Conservation. And with that, Lucas, I'll hand it over to you. All righty. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started here. Thank you for the introduction, Abby. Uh, welcome, everybody. Like she said, the, uh, the title of the presentation today is going to be Soils 101, Composition and Conservation. And so I've got this broken down into a couple of different sections. We're going to talk about basically what is soil, how is it formed. We're going to get back to basics here. Um, a lot of times we get really into the weeds with... Uh, looking at the different compositions of soils and looking at soil tests and making recommendations. And sometimes we forget that uh, we're kind of operating in a bubble and maybe some of the people that we're trying to help don't really have the foundational knowledge that they need to kind of to jump off here. Um, so we're gonna try and tackle that for you here today. We're also gonna take a look at some of the soils that you can commonly find in Michigan to kind of bring this a little bit closer to home. And then we're gonna finish up with what we deal with a lot here at the Conservation District and that is soil conservation. It's sort of the reason we're all here today, it's what the uh, the districts were started and founded on back in the early 1900s. Um, so we're gonna look at some of those health concerns and maybe some remedies and some different approaches that you can take to fix the quality of your soil, enhance the quality of your soil and so on. So what is soil? Uh, we're gonna start there. Here's a few definitions. Basically I pulled one from Google and I pulled one from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay, so the upper layer of the earth in which plants grow, it's a black or dark brown material, typically consisting of a mixture of organic remains, clay and rock particles. Okay, so we're all familiar with this. It's basically what's underneath the grass or the sod. Um, it's usually dark in color. Sometimes it can be lighter in color. Sometimes it can have a reddish hue. This all depends on your geography, right? There are different components that make up um, the soils and they'll have different colors. So to the right, you'll see an image of what we call the soil strata. Okay, so these are the different layers that you'll find as you begin to dig down into the soil. On the left, you'll see that it's kind of broken down by inches. 
And these soil strata are not always zero to two, two to 10. They vary depending on what the soil type is and what the, what the different layers look like, what the different horizons, horizons consist of. And so you could, have, you could have any number of horizons. You could have simply one topsoil layer and the rest is sand underneath. Or you could have something like this where you've got multiple layers of different kinds of material. So from the Encyclopedia Britannica, we get a little bit more in depth and it says here, soil is the biologically active and porous medium that has developed in the uppermost layer of the Earth's crust. Okay, and I've highlighted a couple of key components here. It's a reservoir of water and nutrients and it helps with the filtration and breakdown of injurious weights, wastes, or wastes that are gonna cause some sort of harm to an ecosystem in the soil or above ground. So here's a couple of additional pictures. The one on the left is probably what most folks are familiar with when you start digging up uh, maybe somewhere in your lawn or out in the field to start a garden, you'll start to see the topsoil that's directly below the sod. This is the part of the soil layer or the horizon that's usually, that has the most highest concentration of organic matter. And so we see a darker color. And uh, on the picture to the right, we, as we start to go down, you can start to see in this image that we've got different layers and all sorts of different soil types. And so in the image on the right here, you've got maybe eight inches of topsoil. Underneath that, you've got what looks to be some sort of gravel deposit. And below that, what we'd maybe call the subsoil, you've got some clay looking layers and some different sands and some other mineral deposits underneath. And so once again, you can have an incredible variety of different types of material as you start to go down through the layers of soils. So why is it important? Basically, it acts like a sponge, okay? Soil provides plants with the nutrients required for growth. And if we didn't have this porous soil, we wouldn't be able to trap those nutrients and hold on to them long enough to make them available to the plants. So this is important to us because basically all of the energy that we use on a daily basis comes directly from the sun to the plants that either we consume or that uh, the other animals and organisms will consume that eventually come to us. So it's, it's strictly linked to the food chains uh, that we use and that all of the terrestrial organisms use, um, you know, unless you part of your diet is some crustacean that's in a seafloor vent, all of us are using uh, the soil to get our, our nutrients for the daily. Um, it helps to filter groundwater. This is also incredibly important. So the plants and the microorganisms that exist in these different soil layers and the fine particulate themselves help to filter out various chemical wastes, animal by byproducts and different things that end up on the surface before we start to consume that groundwater as we pull it from different wells and things like that. So it provides us with a safe and clean drinking source of water. Uh, as, as soils become higher in organic matter, right? These are things like decomposing bits of plant material, decomposing soil organisms and microbes. These could be things like worms, bacteria, different fungi. Uh, as we go up in the percentage of the soil makeup that is organic matter, it can help minimize flooding and drought by acting like a sponge. And so if you've got a very low percentage of organic matter, you're not gonna have a lot of holding capacity. You're gonna have a a sponge that can't hold as much water. And so in the case that we have heavy rainfall, the soil is not gonna be able to as retain as much of that water and some of the wastes and some of the byproducts are gonna be able to leach down into the groundwater. Uh, and the reverse is true for a drought, soils that are higher in organic matter can hold on to that water for longer, which will make it available to the plants over a longer period of time. And so if you've got a healthy soil with lots of organic matter, and let's say we have two weeks without rain, your crops or your lawn or whatever you're growing in that soil is going to have more water available to the plants throughout that drought period before the next rain comes. So just to kind of prove that point a little bit more, every 1% increase in organic matter can result up to 20,000 gallons of available soil water per acre. Okay, so if we do the math and let's say we've got a soil with 1% organic matter and we've got a soil with 3% organic matter, that soil with 3% is gonna have an additional 40,000 gallons of water that's available to plants and microbiology in the soil over a drought period. And just to give you an idea of how much that is, 20,000 gallons is essentially 10 dump, dump trucks full of water. So if you can imagine uh, your neighbor and you are going through a drought, you've got a healthy soil and they don't, you're basically getting a 10 dump trucks of water delivered to your soil every day. 
So one of the most important uh, figures in soil conservation would be Hugh Hammond Bennett. Uh, a lot of folks might be familiar with him. He led the soil conservationist movement in the 1920s and 30s. And so as we made our way out of the Great Depression and into the Dust Bowl, crop production was incredibly important. And we were starting to lose productive soils in the United States very rapidly. Uh, this became a concern of the federal government. And so they decided to start what's called, what was then called the Soil Conservation Service and what is today known as the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, around the same time, conservation districts were also formed. Uh, and it's, but as opposed to the federal government offering this agency, soil conservation districts were started basically behalf on local farmers and consortiums that were interested in the same conservation of our soils. So one of his quotes that a lot of you may have seen is that out of the long list of nature's gifts to man, none is perhaps so utterly essential to human life as soil. Kind of for the reasons that I described, it provides us with our, our sustenance eventually as you go through the food chains and the filtration of our drinking water to supply us with clean, clean rivers, lakes, and groundwater. These two pictures are actually of Hugh Bennett uh, as he was documenting some wind erosion at a peach farm in Van Buren County. So he did operate all over the United States and make different trips out to different conservation districts and different farms to try and help these landowners deal with the, the loss of topsoil. Uh, and these pictures to the right are uh, pictures of Hugh visiting a peach farm in Van Buren County. This peach farm had produced world-class peaches uh, decades prior to these pictures that were actually shipped all the way to France for uh, world exhibitions and stuff like this. And uh, this very same farm after it was uh, made susceptible to wind erosion through maybe some farming practices or something like that uh, has just lost all of its productive quality. And so that's why it's important for us to conserve these, these topsoils that we have. Uh, this is just to kind of give you a, a picture of where this picture was taken. So Covert Township is in Van Buren County and it's right here on the coast. And so the subsoil that you see as a result of this wind erosion is probably just uh, blow sand from dunes and stuff like that that makes up the subsoil. So very fragile. As soon as the topsoil was released and we lost all of this material on top, just left with this sand that's really susceptible to wind and water erosion, and you start to lose all of the productive quality and all the benefits of the soil. So we're gonna start diving into what are some of the components of soil. Basically, it starts out with mineral particles, right? We've got different sand, silt, and clay uh, particles that are they're classified by their size and shape mostly. So sand is anything from half a millimeter to maybe a millimeter and a half. If you start to get into a couple of millimeters, we would, we would start to call that gravel, okay? Silt is gonna be smaller than that, anywhere from half a millimeter down to maybe a few tenths. And as you get microscopic, we've got clay particles. And these will exist in different pockets and different layers throughout the soil structure. So as you start to dig through the different layers, you're gonna find uh, different concentrations of these different particle sizes, okay? And this is one of the ways that soil is classified. Uh, Typically, it's referred to as the parent material. So a definition of that would be the underlying geological material in which soil horizons form. And once again, horizons is just, re horizons is just referring to the different soil layers. In our case, that's going to be a lot of what we call glacial till. You may be familiar with uh, during the last ice age, a lot of uh, Michigan, or most of it anyway, was covered by glaciers miles high. And so that receding and moving of the glaciers basically disturbed the ground and churned up and ground down all of these rocks to form uh, our parent material here in Michigan. Other examples uh, in the South might be bedrock. You can have drift deposits. And in the Great Plains of the United States, much of the soil parent material is, uh, is built off of ancient prairies. So high in organic matter. The, the figure on the bottom right here is a little busy. But if you've ever had somebody tell you that your soil is a sandy clay or it's a silt loam or anything like that, this will give you an idea of where it falls with these different types of particulate. So if you've got something that's more than half clay, we're gonna call that soil just clay altogether. And as you start to move down here into a silty category, and we've got more silt particles than we do sand particles, than we do clay particles, we're into a silt loam. And as you move over here and you've got more sand particles, less clay, less silt, you're gonna call that a sandy loam or a loamy sand even, or straight, just uh, regular sand. 
So the other component of soil is water. If, uh, if we don't have any water, then things can start to become inert really in the soil pretty quickly. So it acts like a sponge. This holds extra water during storms and retains that throughout drought periods. It's necessary for all functions of life. So this is gonna be necessary for the plants that are growing in the soil, as well as the different microbes that are existing in the soil that are helping to act as decomposers, breaking down plant material, uh, or just being predatory of other microbiolo microbiology in the soil. The water in the soil also helps to dissolve some of the minerals and make them available for plants. And so if you can imagine that there's a particular mineral that a plant needs to start producing fruit or produce more leaves, if it's just in a big chunk form, and by big, I mean maybe a millimeter or so in diameter, that's not going to be available to the plant. Uh, water has got a unique quality that allows it to dissolve these minerals and make them available for the plants. It can do that because if you're familiar with the molecular structure of water, it's basically like a, like a small magnet. It's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atoms. We all know that H2O. And it's got a negative, it's got a partially negative side and a partially positive side, like a battery or a bar magnet like this. And so it has the ability to pull different elements and atoms out of their existing molecules and uh, put them into solution. We call that dissolving something, right? You can dissolve salt into water. And now we've got salt water. That looks a little something like this. So again, on the left here, we've got a salt crystal. You can picture this as something that the plant would need. Maybe it's uh, some magnesium salt or something like that the plant needs for development. When it's existing in this crystalline form, it's not available to the plant, okay? Water comes in and once again, we've got these small positive charges and a negative charge. When it's dissolved in solution like this, the water molecules will orient themselves around these particles. Now from NaCl, we've just got chlorine and sodium dissolved in solution. And this is what makes it available to the plant. In this crystalline form, it's too big to take up. It's too bulky for the roots to use or for any sort of bacteria or anything like that to consume. When it's dissolved here in water, now it's available for the plants to take up through their roots, for the microbiology to use, and so on and so forth. So that's really one of the critical components of a, of a hydrated soil. There's also just air and soil. So this, it can be dissolved in the water and also just can be existing between the soil pores or the spaces between these different granules. So this is important because obviously we've got the plant roots have a, are respiring like we do. They're breathing in oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide uh, as they're metabolically active. And that needs to be released back to the surface. And so there's a constant exchange of these different gases between the soil and the atmosphere. Plants use carbon dioxide to grow. And so as the soil is respiring as a system, right? The bacteria are respiring, the plant roots are respiring, the different fungi are respiring. They're releasing carbon dioxide and making that available to the plant as it percolates through the soil surface and makes its way to the atmosphere. So this is, this is happening in, in sort of an ebb and flow as the soil is wetted and saturated and then dried out over uh, periods of drought. So we've got fine particulate matter, we've got water, we've got air, and we've got organic matter. So organic matter is kind of an umbrella term that groups plant matter, uh, animal remains, animal wastes, all these different things. Uh, they're in microscopic chunks, larger chunks throughout the soil. And they basically, they do a couple of things. They're typically negatively charged. And then I'll get into that in a minute here. In the same way that water has some, some polarity and is able to hold on to different molecules, organic matter can do the same. It's a major source of carbon. And so it's providing a food source to all of the microbiology that's in the soils. This way, the, the uh, microbiology have something to eat. They have some uh, metabolic activity going on, and then they're releasing uh, different chemicals that are made available to the plant for their growth. Uh, it acts as a source of nitrogen. So as these decomposers consume organic matter and release plant available nitro nitrogen molecules, the plants are basically being fertilized by the activity in the soil. And so you can think about this as sort of a, uh, a free source. You know, everybody says adding compost to your garden is gonna be beneficial for the soil. Uh, and basically the reason being is that it's gonna have your soil be a little bit more spongy, hold on to water for longer if you've got a relatively sandy soil to begin with. And it's gonna provide all of the microbiology with 
some sort of food source. And so as the bacteria and the fungi and the worms and everything start to consume this food source, they're gonna produce wastes, uh, sort of little microbiological manure that's added back to the soil and provides some fertilization for the, for the plants that you're growing. This is an example of all the different things that you can find living in the soil apart from the plants. And so at the bottom left, you've got organic residues. So the picture shows here a corn cob, some leaf matter, uh, some old chaff, maybe from soybeans and stuff like that. As this breaks down and starts to get incorporated into the soil, it's feeding all of these different organisms, right? So we've got fungi, that's obviously a decomposer, it's gonna start breaking down the plant material. And you've got other mites and worms and protozoa and nematodes and larger worms, beetles, all sorts of things that are living in the soil and helping to break down these uh, different molecules. And, uh, and like I said, provide nutrients to the plants that you're growing. So you can have millions, even billions of these different microbes living in just a spoonful of soil. It's, it's pretty complex. When we bring everything together, we've got what's called a soil aggregate. Okay, and if you were to look under a magnifying glass, you would see this larger picture. We would see different sand grains. These blue particulate basically show different mineral grains. And these brown particles, uh, when we zoom in on them, we can see that they're actually covered in all sorts of different stuff. So these little green bars represent pieces of organic matter, plant litter, right? So we talked about this might be an old piece of a corn cob. This might be a small chunk of a leaf. And you've got all of this different activity happening. You've got these yellow strands that represent uh, fungal hyphae, which are basically the root systems or the sensory organs of a, of a fungus. And they start to break down this and use it as a food source along with bacteria, along with other uh, organisms in the soil. And as they do this, they start to glob onto each other, right? And so we start to construct these balls of material. Sometimes they're called crumbs in a soil. If you can imagine the soil being sort of like wetted breadcrumbs, uh, instead of just fine particulate, we've got these conglomerates of, of a whole host of different materials that start to add some structure. Uh, the plant roots that exist, old dead pieces of plant roots that exist, and these uh, tendrils of fungus, these sensory organs and these exploratory organs of the different funguses, they start to hold the soil together like a web. And so this is when things start to go from just a pile of sand to a kind of a cohesive system of different organisms that are contributing to what we call topsoil. Basically, we can divide when we look at soil and it's got different properties, we can divide it into chemical properties and physical properties. A chemical property that you've probably heard most about soil is pH. So this refers to the acidity of any sort of substance, right? Like we've all heard, all heard that Coca-Cola or orange juice can be acidic. Those fall into something like maybe three or three and a half on a pH scale. Regular drinking water is at about seven, uh, which means it's neutral and something like bleach or let's see, drain cleaner that's very caustic, that might be all the way up at like a 13 or a 14. So pH is, is really critical to how healthy your soil is. Most plants wanna grow in something that's in the range of maybe a six and a half to a seven. So very close to being a neutral, a neutral system. Um, some plants want something that's a little bit more acidic and there are different things you can do to change the acidity level of your soil. If it's too acidic, let's say it's at a five or something like that, and we want to increase the, uh, increase the number, make the soil, soil more basic. And you might add something like uh, mineral lime, ground up limestone to the soil. That'll, bring the, that'll make it more alkaline and bring the pH up. If you want to make it a lower in pH, let's say you have a soil that's at about an eight and it's not being very productive, you might add something like sulfur to the soil to bring that back down closer to a six and a half or a seven. We already talked a little bit about particle size, but this is what is a big way of how different soils are classified and so uh, as a soil scientist is making their way around uh, a project site or a municipality or something like that and they're documenting the soils or a farm field particle size whether there's a lot of sand a lot of silt or a lot of clay is going to help them determine when we've got different types of soils organic matter falls into the chemical properties uh, like i said a lot of these molecules and things are what plants need to for their growth and they're, they're only made available as decomposers start to break down uh, old organic matter and make the different molecules and different nutrients available to the plant. 
You've got water, so soils can have all different amounts of water depending on the particle size, right? If you can imagine, uh, we'll go back to this picture here. If you can imagine all these different spaces here would be filled with water in this particular picture. And of course, like I said, some days it'll be drier than others and some days it'll be completely saturated. But the, the water that's there is gonna make a big difference in terms of the rate of nutrient cycling, the amount of minerals and, and uh, nutrients that are available to the plants and uh, to the microorganisms as well. As we start to get a little bit further into the chemical properties, we see something on soil tests called CEC, and that stands for the cation exchange capacity. And well, what does that mean? Uh, this, nobody signed up for chemistry class, but that basically means different soils have a different capability of exchanging cations. And that's just a positive, that's an ion with a positive charge. So picture a molecule that's got a positive charge. A lot of these are things that plants are gonna to wanna to use as a nutrient and the soil can make them more readily available to plants based on a couple of different things, right? The water that's being held there can make them available because it's gonna be able to be held onto by the small negative charges on a water molecule. A lot of organic matter is, is negatively charged and can hold on to cations easier and help exchange them with plant roots. Uh, you'll often hear that a higher organic matter means a better cation exchange capability. And clay particulate also has a negative charge. And so that helps to hold on to different cations throughout the soil layers. You may have a restrictive layer in your soil. So you, you can imagine as we go down through the different layers that you may have some topsoil on top of sand, on top of a incredibly dense maybe 10 feet or so of, of bedrock, right? And that creates an absolutely restrictive layer to plant root development and other things. Um, and this, this isn't gonna exist in every, in every case. In Michigan, we've got a lot of sand, like tens and tens of feet of sand, sometimes hundreds of feet of sand underneath the topsoil before we reach any, any sort of restrictive layer. But this could be bedrock, this could be a hard layer of clay. Uh, there could be a lot of different things that contribute to what we call a restrictive layer. You've got the different nutrients. And so when we talk about nutrients, the big three are nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. And basically those are the three things that plants need to, to survive and thrive. And, and a lot of times it's nitrogen that's the determining factor of vegetative growth and so on with a plant. That's why often a lot of your fertilizers that you might buy, Scott's Weed and Feed and some more professional products that a, a big time farmer might use are, are nitrogen based. And then you've got the parent material, like I said. So there's the parent material has basically decided which organisms are going to start thriving. So if you've got heavy clay or something like that, you're going to have different microbiology than you would if it was a, a larger particulate, like a heavy sand or something like that, that's developing maybe off of the coast of Lake Michigan. So just to reiterate some of the different physical properties, these are the sorts of of things that are gonna happen as you change the different physical properties. So if the aggregated soil is like this, you're gonna have channels where water can flow through. These are also the same channels where oxygen and carbon dioxide can diffuse between the atmosphere and the soil itself. And these are the same channels that roots are gonna use and different funguses are gonna to use to explore the soil and basically look for their nutrients. Uh, if you've got a bunch of fine particulate like this, that's sort of crusted over the soil surface, your soil is not going to be as readily penetrable by, by uh, different gases, different liquids, and different plant roots and so on that are trying to access different parts of the soil. Um, let's see. Different soils have different mineral contents as well. So they've got, you know, because of the parent material, they've got different uh, combinations of minerals that exist in the soil. So there's going to be different amounts of magnesium, maybe aluminum, iron, zinc, things like this. These are trace minerals that plants and, and different microbiologists, microbiologies use for their development. And so they're gonna be more, well, we could say better or less suited to development for a, for a variety of microorganisms and plants, depending on what kind of soil you're dealing with. And just to reiterate some of the chemical properties, when we're looking at physical properties, think about the structure of the soil. When we're looking at chemical properties, we're going to think about the chemistry of the soil. And this has a lot to do with the different charges and the different uh, in the solution, as well as the different particles that are throughout the soil. So again, here we've got an example on the left is a, a piece of humus, which is basically organic material. 
This here in the center is a way zoomed in picture of a clay particulate. And this on the right is what we call a chelate. Uh, a chelate is basically a metal atom that's got two negative arms to it. And so in this case, the organic matter is negatively charged. So it's able to hold on to all these different cations. You've got calcium, you've got magnesium, same thing with the clay here, calcium, magnesium. And then the chelate on the right here is able to hold on to zinc. And so if you've got a lot of these different things, a lot of organic matter, for example, your soil is gonna be able to hold on to these nutrients for longer and basically give the plants or give the microbes more time to absorb them. So how do you find out what kind of properties your soil has? Okay, the, the easiest way to do that is to have it tested. That's gonna be the most accurate way. There are some things you can find online to explore your soil type and we'll go into that in a little bit, but the easiest way is just, just to have it tested. Uh, historically, we've done that through our land grant university. That's the Michigan State University Extension offices. Um, but you can also have it done through crop consultants, uh, private agronomists and private laboratories can do soil testing for you as well. And there are basic tests, there are very in-depth tests and uh, they go up in price, but they also go up in the amount of information that you're gonna be given on exactly what's going on with your soil. So I think I'll take a break there as we've kind of made it through describing the different components of soil and, and open it up for any questions. I'm not sure if we have any going right now. Yeah, Lucas, uh, thanks. It's going well so far. Um, we did have one question come in uh, and it's a question on bringing in topsoil for someone who's someone's property who's quite sandy um, and they're concerned about possible contaminants of bringing in soil. Could you just talk a little bit about um, how topsoil can be brought in or built on a site? So bringing it in is a great option. Um, coming at it from a conservation standpoint, you're going to want to make sure that it's not being brought in from a place that is uh, their topsoil is being diminished, right? So a lot of times these are imported from possibly sites in Canada and other places around where they're harvesting the topsoil and then reselling it to other places. And so always bear in mind where it's coming from, but that's a great way to get it started. If you've got an incredibly sandy soil and we just want to get a garden started, you know, replacing the topsoil can take a long time, building it up naturally. Uh, I believe the metric is something on the order of three to 500 years to build an inch of topsoil under natural conditions. And so if we just let the grass and the prairie and the weeds grow up, it would take quite some time to get some topsoil. Um, and if we're doing something small, let's say a garden that's maybe a fifth of an acre or, or maybe just a few tenths of an acre, it's a realistic thing that you could do. It would cost you a bit of money. This isn't something that you could do in a whole farm field that's maybe 40 acres or something like that. It would be cost prohibitive to bring that much topsoil in. Um, but yeah, you can also have that soil, you can have that topsoil tested if you want. Uh, sometimes there might be uh, batch tickets or something like that that can give you a breakdown of the contents of the soil. Uh, you could probably also call the manufacturer or the harvester or the deliverer or whatever it is and have them give you a breakdown of kind of what the different components are. You'd want to ask for things like what, what sort of particulate size is this, like a loamy sandy kind of soil, what's, what's going on with this. And, uh, and yeah, those are the different kind of things you'd want to ask before you bring in any sort of topsoil. Excellent. Thanks, Lucas. That's all for now, if you want to move on. Okay. We'll do that. So we'll take a minute here to look at what we've got in Michigan, just to bring this a little bit closer to home. So if you didn't know, Michigan does have a state soil, much like the state bird, the robin and other things, we have a state soil that's called Kalkaska soil. And so it's named after the county and where it's found a lot in the Northern Lower Peninsula. So it's a multi-layered soil comprised of humus. Again, that's organic matter and various types of sand. And, and a lot of it looks just like this. So as you start to go through the different layers, we've got really small amount of topsoil, looks like maybe five centimeters or so. Then you've got what looks like some sort of ashy kind of deposit on top of just sand, sand and more sand. So it makes the soil particularly well designed for filtration because you've got some topsoil on top and you've got organisms and plants that are growing there, taking up wastes and excess nutrients. And then you've got hundreds and hundreds of feet of this sand for the water to filter through as it leaves. So this is one of the reasons that it's contributed to excellent water quality in the Northern Lower Peninsula. I think we've got some of the cleanest lakes in the nation uh, and rivers in, Michi in Northern parts of Michigan. So these sandy soils that exist 
uh, in the northern parts of Michigan have contributed to that clean water source. You can divide the state into more or less two types of soil or two orders of soil. So much like the animal kingdom, we start at the top and uh, we have orders of soil that are broken down into suborders that are broken down into families and so on. But to take a look at it from a landscape view, we've got basically two orders. We've got alpha sols and spodosols. So in Southern Michigan, where we historically had a lot of hardwood forests growing, we've got these alpha sols. And so they're, they're highly leached soils, which means that a lot of the uh, nutrient load in the subsoil has left, probably because the parent material in the subsoil is very sandy, very porous, uh, not a lot of organic matter to hold on to nutrients. And so they're very readily leave the soil as they, as they go down through the sandy layers. Uh, formed under hardwood forests, like I said, it was historically a lot of hardwood, beech maple forests and oak forests and, and other varieties of hardwoods that were growing in the southern parts of Michigan uh, before it was settled by Europeans and Westerners. In the northern parts of the Lower Peninsula and most of the UP, we've got what they call spodosols. Uh, and spodosols, it comes from the Greek, I believe, word spodus or spodic, which basically means wood ash. Um, some more acidic soil where organic matter is combined often with aluminum and leached into the subsoil. And I've got a couple of pictures of that here. So just like that Kalkaska soil, you see this ashy layer on top right below the right below the topsoil. And that's where it kind of gets that wood ash name from. But then again, as you start to move down, it's sand as far as the eye can see. Okay, so these are three different examples of different, uh, these are not all Kalkaska soils, these are all just different spodosol soils. And so they could have different names. These could exist in Wisconsin, these could exist in, in other places that have the same sort of uh, historical vegetation and parent material, but they've all got these characteristics where we've got a small amount of topsoil, maybe 15 centimeters or so of this ashy material and then sand underneath. You can also see dark pockets in some of the subsoil. And this is what they're talking about where some of the nutrients have basically become bonded with aluminum that's in this earth's crust and started to move down through the soil. And then in the lower peninsula, what I'm more familiar with are these alpha sols. And this is basically, we've got some topsoil that was developed underneath these hardwood forests on top of sand. Heavily leached, as you can see, uh, Judging by the person at the bottom of the photo here, you can see there's probably about a foot to maybe 14 or 15 inches of topsoil, and below that is just sand. And this is what you're going to find if you go digging in a lot of the uh, soils in southern Michigan. A lot of times we don't make it past the topsoil because we don't ever plant anything deeper than that. But if you ever go look at construction sites or where they're digging ditches or possibly installing underground utilities, you'll see uh, these roots that don't extend that much further into the, in the subsoil into the sand here. And so they're characterized by this subsoil being heavily leached or basically rinsed of all of its nutrient capacity. And that has to do with, again, like I said, the sand doesn't really have the ability to hold on to those nutrients and different molecules as well as maybe the topsoil would. So once the nutrients leave this topsoil, they head to the sand and then they trickle through pretty readily down into the groundwater. So how do you find out what your soil type is? There's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, what I would recommend is using the web soil survey, and I'm going to go through a bit of that here in a moment. Uh, this soil scientists all over the country throughout the 1960s and 70s had been compiling loads and loads of data about the different soil types that exist, and they've made that database available to the public. So you can find out exactly what they've recorded your soil type as being and uh, pull that information and get a map that shows exactly what types of soil you've got going on. So instead of digging and disturbing the soil, you can kind of get a pretty good idea of the different layers that you have uh, locally. This has also been, this database has also been made available in what we call the Soil Web app. So this is the same database, it's just available on your iPhone or uh, Android device. And I've got a picture on the right here that kind of shows what that looks like. So you can go walk out in a field with your phone, you can upload this app, and then you can get your real-time location and it'll give you what the different soil layers look like, what they're most likely to look like at the location that you're standing on. So this is kind of a way of getting a, an X-ray of the different soil layers uh, on your phone, which is cool. And then of course, you can always schedule a meeting with myself or another conservationist 
Uh, most people that work at a district are familiar with these databases. They've either got old hard copy books that you can walk through, or we can, once again, like I said, use the web soil survey to kind of walk through and investigate the different soil types that you have. This isn't gonna give you an exact readout. If you wanna be more exact with the different components of your soil, then you're gonna to wanna to do something like a soil test and kind of decide, maybe with the help of a conservation district employee, what test is best for you. But if you're just interested in maybe what the parent material was or the different types that are likely to exist in your location, this is a free and easy way to kind of investigate that. So when you first start with the web soil survey, you'll basically get a, an aerial view of your property, of your field, of whatever, and you'll be able to designate the square or the, or the shape of the field that we're interested in looking at, and then it will show you the different soil data. So these orange lines represent what the soil scientists determine the breaks and the soil types to be. And they're all labeled with different codes here. And these codes refer to the key on the left of this image that tells you exactly what the soil type is. So if we look at this field in the bottom right corner, the code that it's giving me here is a 53B, and that turns out to be a KPAC loam, like Michigan lobe. So it's kind of a loamy soil. It's something that you would expect to be good for cropping. It makes sense that they've got a big field here that's devoted to crop production. You can also investigate what the parent material was. So again, if we look at that 53B, we see KPAC loam, and the parent material in this case was loamy till. And if we look at everything that's in this area, we've got sandy outwash, glacial, glacial lacustrine deposits, lacustrine deposits, glacial fluvial deposits. So all of this, like I said, is basically a result of the glacial activity, the melting and the moving and the grinding of the giant glaciers during the end of the last ice age. That was roughly 11,000 years ago, if you're curious. So you can look at all sorts of different soil properties, right? Using this same map, we can start to investigate the different properties that I had talked about before using this free database. So we're gonna, we're gonna work through a couple and I'll just give you some examples of what the readouts look like with this service. So first looking at the percent clay, again, we've got the same farm fields here. You can get an idea of uh, the percentage of clay that might exist in your different soil types. And so as the scientists went through, they started to document all of the different qualities of the soil and throw them in this wonderful database for us. And so in this case, as we get closer to red, like what's right here around the headquarters of the farm, we've got less clay. Blue means a little bit more clay. So this can give you an idea of why there's certain things in certain places. If we look right here, why might they have built this structure here where there's less clay? Well, maybe it was a, easier to establish the concrete footings for the buildings, for example, or do any excavating that they needed possibly for a well, right? Same thing, we see another uh, domicile or a structure over here in an area where there's less clay. So you can kind of investigate your soils this way and start to determine where you might want to put a structure. Uh, people have even used this service to kind of do uh, some investigating before they make a purchase on a property. So here's another one where we can look at pH, for example, right? So the, the level of acidity of the soil. And this one kind of works like a heat map. So the closer you get to red, the more acidic your soil is. The closer you get to blue, the more basic or alkaline your soil is. Uh, this color here in, in the majority of the farm fields is right around a six and a half or a seven, so pretty neutral. You've got some pockets where it might be a little bit more acidic. We're getting into six, maybe just below six. And then once again, you can see where they've decided to put the farm is where it's even more acidic. Maybe this was traditionally not that good for growing crops. And so the farmstead just naturally ended up there. They wouldn't have used the most productive parts of the field to establish their buildings, right? You can look at available water capacity through this service as well. Once again, the blue means we've got more available water. Red means not that much available water in the soil. And you can start to see why, again, we've got these different uh, structures placed here. In the bottom right, we've actually got flooded standing water. Why is it there? Well, this 32 type soil is probably something that's gonna hold more water naturally. And so there exists a pond. And once again, with the headquarters of the farm, red, right? Not a lot of available water. And so that's probably another reason that this location was chosen for the farm. Not a productive soil for cropping, 
probably not very drought resistant. And so they said, hey, that's where we'll put the buildings. It's not going to grow anything anyways. Let's see. So this is organic matter as well. You can see in the fields, we've got some green. That means a little bit more organic matter. And once again, probably why there's such big farm fields here, they found this to be a relatively productive soil because of the heavy amounts of organic matter. And again, we can see where these buildings are, low organic matter. Now they didn't have access to these more than likely when this farm was established, but you can start to see that the people that were living and working the land here had noticed the different productive qualities or lack thereof in the different parts of the field and said, this is just a really unproductive area for these different reasons. It's got low available water. It's got low organic matter. Um, it doesn't have any clay layers. So if we have to dig a well, it's gonna be a good place to do that. Those are the sorts of reasons that contribute to them deciding on where to put their headquarters. And they're gonna leave this, the rest of this productive land up to crop production. Each soil, as determined by the soil scientists. Oh, let me mention this too. All of these have been a measure of these different qualities of the soil in the first 24 inches. Okay, so as you start to investigate these different qualities, you wanna do apples to apples. You always wanna investigate the same depth. So if you're just doing a home garden, you might be interested in only maybe the top 12 inches of the soil. If you're doing cropping, or maybe you're gonna establish some pollinator habitat with deeply rooted species, you might want to investigate maybe the top three feet uh, and so on and so forth. But as you start to compare different soils, you want to make sure that you're doing always the same depth chart. So in this case, we're looking at uh, different erosion factors. So there's two erosion factors that soil scientists have given to the different soil types that we encounter. The one that we're going to look at today is called the K factor. And this is basically a measure of how susceptible a soil is to wind and water erosion based on particulate size, based on organic matter, based on slope, things like that. Obviously, water can have a more drastic effect on soil that's on a heavy slope. Uh, blue, in this case, is going to be more erosive. It's kind of counterintuitive, but a lower K value, which means we're in the orange zone, means less erosive. Blue means we're getting into some highly erodible stuff. So this farmer might want to implement something like a cover crop or something like that into these fields to help protect the soil in the bare seasons or in the non-growing season. Here again, we can see depth to a water table. In this case, the red color means that we're looking at a water table that's relatively close. So the plants in this field won't have to go far to find water. Yet another reason this is probably a pretty productive crop field. The blue means that we've got quite a ways to go. I think it's above 200 inches to get to the water table. So that would be another good thing here for structures. It means we're going to have a smaller chance of flooding and stuff like that, where we've invested all this capital and infrastructure. So that's it at looking through the little database and talk about Michigan soils. Looks like we've maybe got about 10 minutes left. Is that right? Uh, yeah, let's see. 12 or uh, 10 minutes for questions and the rest of the uh, okay. presentation. All right. Well, I'll do my best to kind of rush through this stuff. Okay. Um, I've only got a few more things. Now we're going to talk about conservation. So basically, each of these properties, if it's not in the right ratio, too little organic matter, not enough water, too much clay, a restrictive layer, if any of these sort of measurements start to fall out of whack, now we've got an issue about this, the health of the soil and the conservation of the soil. So as a short list here, again, we've got erosion, like that old picture with Hugh Hammond Bennett, we've got Erosion can be a huge, huge problem depending on what the what the soil type is and what the slopes are like. Nutrient and pesticide leaching. So if the nutrients are leaving your soil very quickly, they're not available to the plant and they can start to impact the groundwater. Compaction, if we drive over it and over it and over it again, we start to close those pores that allow for roots to travel, water to travel, uh, different atmospheric gases to diffuse and all that sort of thing. Soil organism habitat. Um, we might skip that one and I might post the video in the chat. Low organic matter, like I said, is going to contribute to a whole host of different issues. The soil won't be as spongy, won't be able to hold on to as much water. You won't have enough food for the different parts of the microbiology that exist. And uh, you're not going to have as much nutrient availability for the plants. 
and then aggregate stability. So if you remember the soil aggregate are those small crumbs of soil that are conglomerates of sand particles, clay particles, different bits of dead and dying plant material and microbes and bacteria. As those start to break down, uh, you'll have a soil that's more easily eroded, won't hold as much water, and you'll start to have concerns with that. So soil erosion can happen just from the wind or it can be kind of induced a little bit by uh, human intervention. So you've got a tractor in the top image that's running over a field to have it fitted for a planting. It looks like this is probably happening in the spring. Uh, they may choose to do this to reduce the amount of wind erosion when the soil still got a little bit of moisture to it, uh, or obviously on a day that's not as windy. In the bottom picture, you can see this soil looks to me like it's been relatively beat up over the years in crop production. A lot of sand, you don't see a lot of dark color. That means that there's pretty low organic matter. And you can see the particulate is just blown away. And you can have huge losses. You know, if you lose a quarter inch of soil, like we said, that's something that could take 80 or 120 years to replace under natural conditions. You may do something like a cover crop. This bottom picture is really good at showing the grass that's adjacent to the farm field, not losing any soil. It's got the grass acting as kind of a shield to the wind whereas the field itself is losing lots and lots of soil as this windstorm comes overhead. Water's gonna do the same thing. If you've got an unprotected soil in the fall or the spring before or after a planting, the rain that comes down is gonna be able to detach the different soil particles and transport them downstream. It's always gonna follow gravity, right? So you start to lose all of this nice, healthy, organic, active material topsoil is gonna to leave your field and end up in waterways. So you can, you can fix this and in extreme cases, they've done that with terraces. You've probably seen that in Asian cultures and a lot in, in some cultures in the West, they'll terrace fields um, or simply just planting the crop rows on the contour line uh, instead of up and down the hill. So instead of providing like a chute for the water to go down between the rows of corn, you would plant it so that the water flow is perpendicular to the row at every point throughout the field. Nutrient and pesticide leaching is another concern. If we've got a healthy soil, right, we're able to hold on to all these different uh, minerals and nutrients and ions that are critical to plant development. If you've got a lot of water coming through, all of these different atoms can just run right out of the soil down below the root zone where it's no longer available to the plants, and then it's going to start impacting the groundwater. And remember, this doesn't just go straight down. If we've got a river that's nearby, let's say maybe just to the left of this, these nutrients can just migrate maybe down 10 feet and then off to the left and it's only a short ways before they start impacting surface water as well. So when they start to get into surface water, these excess nutrients, you see big algal blooms. The fancy word for this is eutrophication, basically. All this scum and algae and stuff starts to build up and is able to take off, right? Because algae is basically a plant. And so we're feeding the plants in the water with all the nutrients that were meant to fertilize the farm field if we've got a soil that's not able to hold on to these different nutrients. Compaction is a big deal. If we've got a farm field that's been ran over and over and over again in the same rows, you're going to start to develop a layer of compaction. And so this is going to diminish the plant's ability to have its roots explore the different soil horizons, right? And like we had described, you've got different mineral contents in different soil horizons. So a plant might be uh, getting a lot of its free fertilizer from microbiology in this top layer, and they might be exploring and mining different uh, minerals and trace minerals out of the bottom layers. If they can't get down there because there's some restrictive layer from farm traffic or, or heavy vehicle traffic or something like that, then the plant's ability to grow is gonna be diminished as well. And here's a good picture where you can see these same rows have been compacted over and over and over again. And you've actually got these crusted layers that form underneath the soil surface or roots or anything can't get through. Okay, I think I am going to play this video. So I've got a short video from Dr. Chris Nichols, who's a soil microbiologist, and this was produced by the USDA. Um, and it gives a pretty good description of why the diversity of microbiology in the soil is critical as well. Lucas, you'll have to share the YouTube uh, screen. Oh, you got it. I still see your presentation so far. How about now? It's still the presentation. There we go. 
Okay. The role of soil <laughs> microorganisms is often grossly misunderstood. To many of us, the only good bug is a dead bug. We join Dr. Chris Nichols in Mandan, North Dakota to talk about why we need to change our thinking. We, we have this idea that microorganisms are bad. In reality, most of the organisms in the soil are beneficial. Um, both Even the nematodes? Most of the nematodes that are in the soil are not pa plant pathogenic. Most of the nematodes that are in the soil are actually very good at helping with especially nitrogen cycling because they consume a lot of bacteria and when they consume that bacteria, um, part of the waste they give off is higher in nitrogen. So it actually is an important role in the system yes. when you have these levels of diversity of organisms. So when an organism becomes bad, it becomes bad because its population is out of control. That diversity helps to keep populations in check. So in the soil, predator and prey relationships are very important. And every organism is, is either eating another organism or being eaten. <laughs> there are types of fungi that um, actually, they'll kill nematodes. Um, and you have fungi that actually will kill microarthropods. Um, so, you know, even the smaller organisms are able to attack some of the larger organisms. And like I said, then that keeps the, the diversity in the populations in check so that you don't get a population out of control and it doesn't become bad. Okay. So, so it's really important for us to try and work on, on that level of diversity. And a lot of the things that stimulate that level of diversity are the diversity in our crop rotations or okay. diversity above ground. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that diversity above ground is sort of equated or even masked by diversity below ground. So that diversity above ground, what it does is it provides different foods for different organisms because that organic matter, the materials that's inside the plant, have different carbon and nitrogen ratios. And because there's different carbon and nitrogen ratios, it's a different type of food. It's, I, I sometimes talk about, you know, if you do a single crop, a continuous crop, it's kind of like giving the soil the donut diet because you're feeding it the same thing over and over and over and over again. And so the only organisms that are able to grow and repopulate are the same organisms okay. that are feeding off of that. Yes, yes. Whereas when you have that diversity, there are different organisms that, that become players in the system. Lucas, in the okay. interest of time, we do have a question if you'd like to wrap up your presentation and make sure we get, get people out of here at two o'clock. Yeah, absolutely. So just to reiterate what she said, diversity is important. Uh, like she said, if anything gets out of control, we start to have a problem. If you've got too many coyotes, you start to lose rabbits and fawns and all sorts of other critters, right? So same concept in the soil. Low organic matter, we talked about holding less water, holding less nutrients. As you diminish the organic material, you're gonna diminish the ability of your soil to protect you from droughts and provide the plants you're growing with the nutrients that it needs. And then this instability of your soil aggregate. So if this starts to break down, we can have things like the crusting of the soil. It looks a little bit like this, where water's not able to penetrate, gases aren't able to be exchanged with the atmosphere. And so the overall productivity of your soil starts to diminish as well. So I'll wrap it up there. That was kind of a rush through the last section, but uh, let's go ahead and answer some questions if we got them. Cool. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. The first one is from Jenna. She says she's asking, are there ways to avoid soil compaction if you plant in the same areas or fields every year? Yeah, absolutely. You can do something as simple as using a marker to track where your lines are, uh, the drive lines. Um, you can you can do different things. If you're planting it by hand, regular human traffic is not going to be an issue. Vehicle traffic or something like that is where you start to have a problem. You can also deflate the tires or use the reduced pounds per square inch. Um, you might do something like, you know, if we're driving on the road, our tires are going to be at 32 PSI or something equivalent. If you're driving in the field, you might want to reduce that all the way down to 10 pounds per square inch. That's going to give the tire a wider base. It's going to belly out a little bit and cause a, a large reduction in compaction. So if you, if you know you're gonna be driving in the same lanes over and over again, let's say it's an orchard uh, or a vineyard or something like that where your, your traffic patterns are limited, try to alternate rows, 
try to straddle your old drive lines if it's possible and deflate the tires on whatever you're driving with. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Lucas. Unfortunately, that is all the time we've got for questions. Um, but let's see, I'm going to share my screen real quick. I'm going to kick you off. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Lucas, um, for the, spending your time with us today. Um, the this was the Van Buren Conservation District Backyard Symposium webinar series. And we'll hope you, we hope you join us for more of these sessions. As a reminder, you can contact us through our contact form on our website, vanburencd.org forward slash contact dash two, or you can sign up for a newsletter using the subscribe box option at the bottom of our website. This webinar is being recorded and these and the recording will be posted next week on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Van Buren CD forward slash videos. Follow us on Facebook at Van Buren CD. And remember that we have a, another presentation tomorrow, same time, same link with Kevin Haight, Jeff Green, and Paul Wells talking to us about outdoor recreation in Van Buren County. It'll be a good one. Thanks again, Lucas, and thank you for all our participants. Yep, thank you, everybody.